Eber. You know, life journey is a very difficult one. And we have our guest here, Dr. Emmanuel Sungwa, a lecturer in the University of Boyle, who have come to narrate his life stories in order to be able to motivate the youth who are out there because we are facing, we are facing turbulent times in our society. Welcome, Dr. Sungwa. Thank you very much, Dr. Busi. A little bit of correction, I'm a lecturer in the University of Bamenda, Thank not you. Boya. Thank you. So, Doctor, you're welcome. Thank you. Doctor, who is Dr. Shu Emanuel? Dr. Shu Emanuel Ngwa is an ambitious young scholar from Mezam Division, Northwest region of Cameroon. Precisely from where? Your village? Barfoot Subdivision. So, what are your childhood experiences, sir? Childhood experiences, um, that's a very good one. I will begin by saying that nobody came to this world by, mis by mistake. Um, according to my mother, my childhood experience started from <laughs> her uh, days in secondary school. So, I'm a product of her secondary school experience. So what were the turbulent moments in your childhood experiences? So the she, difficulties and the challenges you faced, sir? Yes, uh, she told me that when she gave birth to me as a child while in secondary school, in order not to drop out from school, she had to uh, take me to my grandmother. And it is thanks to my grandmother that I was brought up, which means I can virtually tell you that I was breastfed by my grandmother, not my mother. So we are saying that uh, living in African context, uh, a child is a community child. Absolutely. And what were your neighborhood experiences as you were growing up from primary school to secondary school? My neighborhood experiences, I had to, when I became uh, conscious of society and of my environment, I integrated with my uh, friends of my mates, my age mates within my environment, and we played together and we uh, did things together. You know, when growing up, there are things which we <laughs> did in life that if you sit back today and look at them, you will love that truly it is God that has been protecting us. It's due to your hard work too? Of course. Okay, but did you have any peer pressure when you were growing up? Of course, every child should have peer Was pressure. Was it negative or positive? Both negative and positive, but if we look at um, educational-wise, I would say positive in peer pressure. Of, in, in terms, terms of? In terms of uh, the friends that influence me to decide to choose education over other things. I discovered that sometime in your life, uh, Dr. Shu Emanuel, you grew up in a camp. What was your experience in the camp? That, I was still to come to that. You know, uh, I started my secondary school in Barfoot. Class one. Can you narrate to us your primary to secondary school life? All right, thank you. In class one, in Presbyterian school, Mambo Barfoot, the first year, <laughs> I was number 69 out of 70 ah, in the class. That's an issue. And uh, that, uh, my grandmother didn't take that lightly. And she told me, <laughs> I'm very stubborn in the village and I will not have, to, I will not be able to stay here. And that led me to moving movement from Bamenda to Tiko. And I came to Tiko with my uncle, who I call now my father, because all my educational career is thanks to him. And he is the one now who puts me back in class one in Tiko. And from then, in my first year in class one, I was number 10 okay. out of 80 from <laughs> number 69 out of 70 to number 10 out of 80. So that is when I started my educational success. What about your secondary school life? And while, after finishing my secondary school, and while going to secondary school, it will be interesting to note that while in primary school, 
I used to see these truck drivers who drive tippers, uh, moving sand from one place to another. And I was so, I was admiring them so much so that I had the ambition of becoming a, a truck driver. driver. Yes. And when I finished, I, at one time, my friend told me that if you want to be a truck driver, then you also have to learn a diesel mechanic. And I said, yes, then that would be interesting. So when I was about finishing class seven, I told my uncle that, I would love to be a truck driver and I want to start from diesel mechanic. I asked you a question about your calm life. Wait, I'll come, okay. I'm coming to that. Yes. And uh, he told me that if I don't go to secondary school, he, I will have to go back to the village and learn the diesel mechanic and the truck driving there. And I told him I'm not going to the village and that is how I found myself in secondary school. And so, why in that primary school, from that primary school period to my secondary school, we were in a CDC camp? Did, because you drop, did you ever drop out from school? I didn't drop out from school because we were in the CDC camp. I was with friends in the CDC camp where we were all schooling together. And so, peer why pressure. Were why were the challenges in terms of peer pressure? Of course, you know, you know the, 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 the CDC camp life, many types of experiences. Uh, different influences. Give us some of the experiences. Of course, very young children, very young boys and girls, you see them already chasing girls up and down, chasing boys, and so you find yourself within Sexual them. Sexual at that Of course, age. of course. And a very small girl like this, you see him, uh, her already pregnant, and you see a small already boy like pregnancy. this already chasing a young girl, and you are wondering, and it is such influences we're trying to pull to deviate you from your direction. And so, those are the some of the experiences Due that one- to those difficult early life experiences and challenges, what motivates you to become a doctor today? The story of becoming a doctor- And a university lecturer for say. It it, it, that one started in, uh, when I was in Form 5, because remember, I said I never had secondary school ambitions. So, uh, going to secondary school, I was just trying to stop my uncle from sending me back to the village. So when I reached form five, and uh, I had a dream one day, and uh, I saw myself teaching very big students. And after, in that dream, somebody told, addressed me as professor. And uh, when I got up, I asked my friend, what's the meaning of professor? He said, professor, is, there are people who teach in the university. And before you reach there, you must have at least a master's degree. Yes. And that is when I knew of a master's degree. And I started telling my friends that I will have to become a master of international relations or history. I never knew there was a PhD. <laughs> so when I reached high school, I heard now of a doctor, which is after master's, and that those degrees you have, that, that's they a terminal degree. They, you have to have them before I can have access to become a lecturer in the university. And that is when now I told myself that if I saw myself in the dream, teaching big people, and they address me as professor, therefore, that is my direction so of my life. So what was the motivation behind? Of course, the motivation was that dream, and to make it in life and make a difference from the family I was coming from. So you are coming from a humble fam background? I'm coming from a humble background. And basically, I was the first person in my family, my mother's family, to, to, break, to break the cycle of ordinary level wow. and break the cycle of That's good. advanced level before others could follow. I want to ask you this question. There is this great man, Thomas Edison. He failed so many times, but he became the person who discovered the electrical bulbs. And Thomas Edison failed so many times. If you look at people like Oprah Winnie, they fail so many times in their life. They have life challenges and turmoil, difficulties. And today, Oprah Winnie became one of the best presenters in the world. What is your motivation behind your success? Can you tell us a resume of your success story from the trajectory from a primary school to secondary school to university who are your mentors who are your role models yes in primary school at the primary school level i had many friends and some of them were very good educationally 
and I identified with them and had to follow their footsteps. And even today, there are some of them. Who are the people? I have, for example, the present vice principal of Government Technical High School Boya, Miss Emilienne Namondo. She was my bench mate and my classmate in class seven. And she was very intelligent. And I admired and looked up to her as a, a peer that I had to follow so that we succeed together. And when I looked at her today and we sit what today, did you we model in, What did you model in her? I modeled her. What did her. you model in her? Of course, she was a very humble lady, very calm, very calculative. And uh, she was very neat in school. And uh, I had to follow her footsteps especially we, as we were on this, in the same class, sitting on the same bench. And I'm happy that today we are still together moving on the same path to okay. academia. Let's and look at this. Let's look at it from this perspective. When you were already an adult, yeah. who, who was your model at the level of your university study? All right. What of secondary school? Uh, no, university study. Let's oh, go there. Okay. University. In 2005, when... Before coming to the university. And I discovered that uh, from reading your profile, I discovered that you were a student actor and in the University of Boya. You, be, you were part of UPSU in the University of Boya. Student uh, Union. Student Union. You were yeah. part of the Student Union in the University of Boya. We know of people like Mark Barretta. Mm -hmm. And we can, see the, we can see their influence in society today, both positive and negative. Mm -hmm. What made you not to be wayward? As, uh, is, because we know the background of those who have been in UPSU. What made you to be wayward and who are the persons who mo you model and, and who are the persons who mentored you in the university that you became a university don at your tender age, at the age of 32, 30, you're already, a, you, a, a, you're already having a PhD. All right. Thank you very much for that question. While in the university, remember I told you I already had my pathway, which I was following. And when I came to the University of Boya in 2005, my first lecture was uh, with Professor Kanute Ambengwa, a professor of history, University of Bamendai, presently Dean Faculty of Arts. And uh, when he presented the lecture, and I was moved, and I said, this man has my names, and he's my lecturer, and I want to be like him. And I met, and I had to, moved closer to him and told him that I want to be like him one day in the future. And he said, okay, that's good. So you will have to work hard that whatever you do, always remember where you are going to since you've decided to cho choose this path. And I say, thank you, Prof. And that is how I was working in the university. Even when I became involved in student union activities as a secretary general of the Faculty of Education and as a student representatives in the student parliament, I was still conscious of my direction in okay. terms of Why? academics. Okay, Dr. Kanuti was, you modeled him, and I also saw Dr. Kanuti, he was, is, when you model people in life, is good. Yeah. Because I also saw Dr. Kanuti, he was one of your examiner yeah. when you were defending your PhD yeah. to say that he was a role model. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Orr, did you do any volunteerism that impacted your life? Absolutely. After, at, in my final year in the University of Boya, I was already volunteering, volunteering as a personal assistant. To a visually impaired lecturer who was just employed in the university. And the first visually impaired lecturer who was employed in the university by Dr. Name? Charlie Newgap. And uh, he just came in and discovered that I was uh, that person who had an experience of working with persons with visual impairment and he had to uh, engage me. So you're, to you're so lawyer, you're humble. You're saying that it's good to be humble. It's good to be humble, and God has given me that grace to be humble and to serve. So I became his personal assistant, like sighted reader. So I had to be reading for him and recording his notes for him and so on. So that's my first aspect of volunteerism. And then after graduating from the university, I volunteered for uh, non-governmental organizations. And even when I went for, to Nigeria for my master's degree, 
I I'll come there. I'll come there. I'll come there. Yes. I'll come there. Please. I want to know your experiences in volunteerism and what can you tell the youth out there about volunteerism and how can it serve development? Volunteerism is the best root of self development because if you want to wait until when you have a job to start developing yourself you will not by the time you will be having one they'll be asking for an experience that's good and that experience is the experience you must have gotten that experience through volunteerism okay, doctor, in, in few seconds look at the camera direct and uh, and advise Cameroonian youths on how your experiences as a youth could help them navigate difficult life trajectories and become responsible adults. First, Look at the camera, please. First, the first thing is that they have to have focus. They must be focused because those who failed in life is because their focus was broken. So they must be focused and, so, and also they must have a spirituality. Your spirituality is very important in determining the direction of your life, whether positively or negatively. So they must have a, the right spirituality and so they must have the right role models. They must have the right peer influences and also they must have the right interaction daily interactions in society and so after finishing from school if they don't yet have jobs payable jobs it is always necessary for them to do community service volunteering in one way or the other they can create jobs for themselves creating jobs for themselves means you can decide to volunteer keep yourself busy so that by the time you are finding a job that requires an experience, you must have had experience in your volunteerism and your community service, and you just move into it with that experience. That's good, doctor. That's good. That's good. Doctor, uh, permit me also say this. Mm -hmm. Looking at your academic uh, trajectory and uh, the, the discovery you have today in terms of your experiences and the skill development. Mm -hmm. I discovered that you did your master degree in Nigeria, mm -hmm. the University of Soka. Uh, I want to ask you, what were your experiences in that university? And I discovered that, doctor, after having your PhD in the University of Boya, in the Department of Educational Foundation and Administration, as a young doctor, at the age of 30, your university where you did your master degree called you back for services for teaching in the University of Nigeria, Soka. Uh, what prompted them to call you back as a student back then in the University of Soka? All right. Thanks very much, doctor. Um, after my first degree, I attempted doing master's in UB and uh, I was not... Permit me, doctor. Uh, our callers should not call... Uh, our, those, our viewers, should not call, please. Uh, they can send SMS from the number 6539968777 because I've discovered that people are calling. Send messages, not calls, please. Right on, sir. All right, thank you very much. So after my graduation from the University of Boya, I attempted uh, enrolling for master's degree at the University of Boya, but because of the tough competition, I wasn't admitted. So my mentor now, Dr. Kanuti, called me and advised me that I should move to Nigeria where he had lectured before coming back home to the University of Boya. And he directed me to the University of Nigeria and Suka where he was HOD for History and International Studies. And that is how I found, found myself at the University of Nigeria and Suka. And uh, you, it will be interesting to note that uh, my first day in a lecture, my professor asked, two questions. Nobody was unable to answer, and I answered them. Wow, 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 and wow. she asked me, where are you coming from? I said, from Cameroon. You were, you were a product of that same university. Were you a product of that same university? That's my... At the level of master's? Yes. Okay, good. That's the university where I was doing master's. So she asked me, where are you coming from? I said, from Cameroon. She says, that's good. So from today, after this lecture, I'll hand over my keys 
the keys of my office to you. You'll be attending to my undergraduate students. And when I'm not available, you teach my undergraduate students. And that is how I became a graduate assistant wow. while doing masters, supervising our undergraduate students, and also teaching her undergraduate students. And every month, she will give me a pocket allowance and even give me food because to take to the hostess. Because of that volunteerism. And that is how I became, uh, I started living my life comfortably in Nigeria. But, and because, remember, I was struggling while studying there because my sponsor was not a well-to-do person. He was just managing to ensure that I realized my vision, which I had already told him. And remember, I was a product of a CDC camp. Therefore, he was a CDC worker who was not earning any reasonable amount to send me to Nigeria to pay a school fees of 1.5 million every so how academic you, okay, year. Okay, you are told of a school fees that is very expensive. Doctor. Yeah. And then how do, were you able to pay a school fees of, of a, a, a million and more when, we, uh, when in Cameroon universities we pay just 50,000 francs? So that is... How did you complete your school fees then? When I went there, I told them that I have the ability to finish this program in one year instead of two years. And my sponsor has been able to raise money for one year. They said, okay, go ahead and let's see. So by one year, two months, I was done with the program. And since That's my good. sponsor had taken a loan, he paid the first year. But because I have entered into two months, entered two months into the second year, I was held back to pay for the second year. And we had to take loans. We had to source for loans okay, and doctor, we paid I, for I discovered that I discovered that after your PhD, you were recruited in that same university. What motivated them to recruit you? Good. So my volunteerism, why doing master in that university? And uh, remember I started PhD there. And because of a 500% increase in my school fees, I had to return home and re and enrolled re enrolled for phd year at the university of boya and when i finished year i was caught back there for a lecturing position because they realized my potentials why i was doing masters there remember i graduated as best student uh, best master student in comparative and international education That's good. so that is why i was caught back and given an opportunity to lecture in one of the federal universities around that area, not precisely in the University of Nigeria and Suka, where I did my master's. Okay, I discovered that uh, you did your PhD just for, you know, we know of persons who have done their PhD for about 10 years, seven years, they didn't complete. Yeah. But I discovered that you did your PhD for two years and so, and, and more. Two about years, six months. Two years, six months. Yeah. What prompted you? Because I myself, I did my PhD for three years. What prom What motivates you? And how can you motivate the postgraduate students in Cameroon doing PhD to do their PhD in the normal time? That is three years. All right. Uh, first, your focus. Remember your focus, and then you. If you happen to have a good supervisor and a mentor, is there ba are there bad supervisors? Of course, there are bad supervisors too. So how do you term a supervisor a bad supervisor? A bad supervisor. Are some of the students not lazy. Some of the students. That's why I said your focus and your supervisor. So if you are not focused, you means you are lazy. So first, I already knew where I was going, and I knew that my sponsor is managing to send me to school and I have not yet had the means so I need to do everything to make him happy and therefore focus should not be broken. Thank God I fell in the hands of a father par excellence as a supervisor, Professor Fonken Epa George, who well, is former, the former DV, uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research and the University of Boya and former Deputy Vice Chancellor for Chishin. Professor Emeritus. Professor Emeritus now. He now he is also now the DVC tick of Biaka University Institute. So I fell in his hands as a supervisee. And he told me that Emmanuel, if you can deliver this thing in record three years, I'll allow you to go. I'm not that type of person who delays students here. And I say, Prof, I will do it. And behold, 
Two years, six months, I submitted my final copy. I want to know, you. I want you to look at the camera, doctor. Look at the camera. We have so many uh, young Cameroonians who are doing postgraduate studies, who have been doing PhD for four, five, six years, who are complaining. And I've, dis I've seen some who have written letters and table letters to vice chancellors. What are some of the things, some of the indicators, some of the parameters, some of the paradigm shift that you can educate and motivate these postgraduate students to have their PhD on record time, please? All right. I will tell them that first they have to be focused and they have to listen to their supervisors and they have to be very, 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 very humble. Because the fact that you are doing a PhD does not make you, uh, warrant you to be proud. In fact, doing PhD is a test of humility. It is not a test of your intelligence. Because before they admitted you for the program, they already knew that you are intelligent. So they don't need to know you, how intelligent you are again uh, in that program by you trying to show up that you are, I know this, I know this. No, whatever your supervisor says, humbly submit and follow it religiously. In fact, your supervisor is your coach and your mentor, and he is the one. He has the, the knife and the yam. He is, he, the, your PhD shall be given to you so at his discretion. That, are you saying that the life of students depends on the, PA, the, 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 the supervisor? Absolutely. They have your destiny in their hands. They are, de they are like demigods. Absolutely. In the academic gods. They are they academic, academic gods. gods. That's, yes. good. Yes. That's good. But I want you to see. What were some of the things that motivate you? I want some of the burning things within, the internal motivation within that helps you to have your PhD in record time. My desire to succeed in record time and to make a difference in my society. Those were the burning desires within me. My desire to succeed in record time and to make a difference in society and to prove to those who are coming from humble backgrounds that it is not yet over until it is over you can make it no matter where you are coming from you just have to be focused you just have to be determined you just have to be humble and you just have to respect your academic mentors and submit to your supervisors and of course, they will guide you to the end. Yes, doctor. So you are trying to say that uh, your background in life doesn't matter. You can be coming from a humble background tomorrow. You become an emeritus professor. Absolutely. You become a great leader. Yeah. I want to. I want to shift out of the university community. And before I shift out of the university of community, you are one of the young Cameroonian PhD holders that benefited uh, the largest from the presidential recruitment, the first phase of it. So what are you going to tell President Paul Bia, the President of the Republic of Cameroon, about that recruitment? And what are the benefits of such recruitment in our contemporary society? Well, I'm a product of what I call uh, the presidential benevolence of the President of the Republic. And uh, I will have to say thank you, sir, for that gesture because it came just at the right time. Even though I was already lecturing as an international staff in the university in Nigeria, but that opportunity... What prompted you to come back to Cameroon? Because... Because you were already having a good job in Nigeria. I think that home is home. What prompted you to leave Nigeria to come back home to gain your recruitment as a university lecturer? Doctor, Emmanuel? Very good question. When you are working at home, you are serving your own people. You are giving back to your community, immediate community, and you are very relaxed serving home. You are not in, under any tension, huh? and you are competing with people of your immediate environment, especially as a beginner. It is always necessary to start from where you are coming from. And so when I started over there, I was not really comfortable and I needed to start in with my own people, especially as they have given me that education from primary to first degree and to PhD. And I needed to give back to the community first before thinking of going international. And that is why I came back home. And I also came back home because as an ambitious scholar, there is the extent to which I will go 
at home in my country to succeed in my ambition, but I cannot go to that extent when I'm serving in a foreign country because that aspect of citizenship and non-citizenship will always come into play. Okay, doctor, we are looking at reckoning, reckoning life pathways. Yeah. Looking at your past stories, your today's glories, and your future, and your forethought. And I want, to t <coughs> I want you to answer this question. International brain drain is something that is killing the economy of Cameroon. As a university dome, what can you talk about that? Well, brain drain is a serious problem in Africa in general, Give and it, not only in Cameroon. What about the context, the context of Cameroon development? Because we know that higher education, because you, I discovered that uh, while looking at your profile and your experiences and your CV, your curriculum vitae, I discovered that you have done a lot on uni higher educational funding, on university funding. Mm -hmm. So what can be the contribution of your PhD research to the development of Cameroon or the university community and link it to international brain drain, how we, the effect of international brain drain in developing our country, Cameroon? All right. So now, one of our, the problems of our state universities is funding. And there is a very high funding problem in our universities. And because of that, the universities have not been able to put in place the necessary infrastructure and resources to build a quality system that can train youths or students with the necessary capacity to integrate into society and create jobs for themselves, not waiting for government to give them jobs. And because of that, our students, our graduates often go out uh, not well prepared, and so they become lacking in society in terms of employment. And because of that, they decide to start hunting for greener pastures to go out. Why those who go out who have used their intellectual know-how to explore other opportunities to develop themselves. Immediately they are finishing, they are looking for how they can get better quality resources or universities out there to further their studies. And because of that, they go out. And when they must have finished out there, they see, they embrace other good opportunities and they are no longer why thinking of think, coming why, why home. Why do you think that most of these scholars who go out there, they don't come back? Because of uh, good working environments, good resources, they have been pay offered packages, pay packages, and as a result, they are not thinking of coming back to meet the, doctor, the failed system which they your, met. We are talking of reckoning life pathways, doctor. Yeah. Looking at your life success and like the success stories, doctor, what prompted you to walk back home? Because I feel that we must all contribute to nation building. If you are able to reckon your success story without the impact in your own community, then your story will not impact life. So I want you to narrate to us. You started your primary school somewhere. You started in Barfoot. As a university done today, what have been your impact in the community development of your own birth community? Okay. Uh, I'm just starting my career. I'm just starting my career. So, so what, ab what about the vision you have for your community? The vision I have as an educationist, as an, as an education scholar, the vision I have for my community certainly is, would be education uh, inclined because I have the ambition to train other young uh, 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 children from my community who will not be How able to, to have that? access to education How the way I do. do that? Of course, there are scholarship programs which I can create to give scholarships to young, the, the young ones of my community who do not have the same privilege I had to go to school. Because, you know, society is in strata and there are very children, very intelligent children from very humble communities or very humble backgrounds who do not have the means to access education. And I will have to ensure that I contribute in assisting them to acquire education. Good education. Yeah. Uh, doctor, uh, what were some of the painful moments or the painful experiences in your life? Painful experiences in my life is first, um, 
as a child growing up without motherly love but with her grandmotherly love so even up to date the rapport between me and my mom the is bond. not really flowing the bond. so when my lost my grandmom it was like i lost my mother and also in secondary school the difficult moments were uh, schooling trying to trek very long distances and uh, go to school and return you know in in barefoot very very long distances. very long distances so when you are staying beside the school it's like you are one or you come from one of the richest homes and you are able to rent a house beside the school so trekking long distances with some of the challenges and then in the university is you come you meet students from different economic backgrounds different social backgrounds and you are coming from a very humble background and you look at where you are staying and you look at where others are staying you are asking yourself is this life really fair and uh, some of those things also even though there are challenges they push you that be going you will need to also make somebody be like this in future and so those as the challenges were coming that is how also they were inspiring me and i must say that one of my very uh, the highest, my highest negative experience in life was when I had the opportunity to go to Paris. I want, I know of that story, doctor. Let me come there. I, I want you to inject to us that story because there's what we call in life. This is, I always say this as a positive applied psychologist and the host of this show, I always say people should not give up in life. Yeah. Uh, they should be resilient. When you fall, you bounce back to life yeah. and you keep on going. There was an experience in your life in later uh, 2000 and uh, what was it 17 two th late 2017 whereby you had this opportunity to work with the World Bank yeah and you were selected as one of the youngest Cameroonian who participated and succeeded in the examination yeah. to work in the World Bank in, in Paris yeah and uh, you had some challenges uh, how did you overcome such challenges and difficulties because I discovered that at the end you did not travel to Paris. What happened? Well, that is my highest negative experience in life, which if I didn't, uh, uh, if I didn't become a, how a, can I say a it? University done? A, not a university done. That challenge had the capacity to derail me completely so in life. Can you share to us or to the televiewers the experiences you have? Well, we, we were 15,000 PhD students in the world. By then, I was rounding up my PhD. We were 15,000 PhD students in the world who wrote an examination. And we, I happened to succeed to become one of those from Africa and also Cameroon. I can say maybe I was the only person from Cameroon who was now invited to Paris for an oral interview. And attending that interview alone, Everything was paid for. I was just, I just needed to go to the embassy for them to stamp my passport and I go my way. And by attend, with attending that interview too, I was supposed to be paid. Displacement allowance and so on. So it was going to be that a peak of my experience as a growing student, a growing scholar and so on. And I was very excited to go to Paris. And behold, I had printed all the necessary things that they had already paid for me to just go and collect visa. And when I went to the embassy, they took my passport and asked me to come on the day I was supposed to travel. And leaving my home that day, I was already very sure that I'm just passing through the embassy to pick up my passport with a visa and then dash into the airport and go to Paris. Behold, when I arrived at the embassy, they gave me an empty passport and with a note written there, we are not certain of your willingness to return back home after the interview. Oh, that's very challenging. So, to, sh to show how, com how devastated I, were, or I was, I left the, in the embassy instead of returning to They're the confused. motor park They're to confused. get to my i was confused i started moving into the town and before i discovered myself that i was somewhere in the and middle I, of the town and confused know, i know there's that uh, denial yeah there's that denial there's that anger there's that anxiety yeah there's that stress 
uh, for you, and there is the problem of acceptance. Yes. How did you overcome all those challenges, and how how did that prompt you to work hard to be a university dorm today? So when I discovered myself in the middle of the city, not knowing particularly where I was, I had to ask the people where am I. They now told me where I was. I had to take a taxi back to the park and took a, another vehicle back home. And when I arrived home, I locked myself in the house for 10 days. I never came out. That's painful. Just That's painful. to That's calm painful. down the anger That's painful. and to regain myself. To regain and, psychological well-being. Yeah, of course. And when I regained myself, I now told myself, it is not over until it is over. You never gave up. Of course. When there is life, there is hope. I like that. There's always light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. So what prompted you, what gave you the energy to have your PhD when you failed to travel to Paris to work with the World Bank? Of course, the World Bank project was just part was just to complement my PhD because they were also to sponsor me back to come and defend my PhD. So since it was just a complimentary, it wanted to compliment me as a scholar, I said I will still have to complete my PhD anyway. So I had to continue with my study and I succeeded. Looking at your life experiencing, they can help a lot of Cambodians to shape their life. Yeah. I've observed that uh, apart from, I want to ask you, apart from your academic, what about your social life? Can you tell us a bit about your social life? Are you married? Mm -hmm. Not right. yet married. Or single session? Not yet married, but I have a fiancé. That's good. A Cameroonian? <laughs> no, we'll know that when the time comes. Oh, oh that's good, that's good. <laughs> Can you tell us about your hobbies? Um, my hobbies, I love uh, watching political debates, and also I love reading uh, books. A different calibers of interdisciplinary material. So I love reading across boards. So and I also love watching um, uh, watching gospel programs, okay. especially music. That's good. Mm -hmm. When I watch you on Facebook, I've discovered that you admired President of America, President Donald Trump. What do you admire in Donald Trump that can inspire some youths out there? Donald Trump, President Donald Trump, is that type of leader who believes in what he believes in, no matter what people say, that is what he believes in. And that is my type of person. Whatever you believe in, nobody should ever tell you that it is not good or it is... Do so far as you believe in it and you have the conviction that this is right, do it. And when it fails, you go down with it. And if you succeed, you have succeeded. So if you want to be a good leader, you have to stand to be that leader that you stand on your ground. You choose what your direction to follow and don't depend on too much influences from sites, influences from people. Thank you, Dr. Emmanuel. What makes you a successful man? Are you fulfilled? Fulfilled? Yes. Are you a happy man? I'm happy, but I'm not yet fulfilled. So what are your dreams? My dreams are to one day become a professor of proven merits, creating impacts not only in Cameroon, but in the international community. How will you do that? Hard work, focused in the direction of my career. And in publications? and contributing through research, teaching, and community service. Like what um, you are doing now. Um, uh, like I what want, you are doing uh, now. Yes, I want, to, I want to congratulate you for starting this show because as a scholar, you, uh, you are not only uh, to teach and research, but you are to do community service. And introducing this show, uh, Reckoning Life's Pathways, is your own way of contributing to community service as one of your functions as a scholar and a lecturer. Thank you, doctor. Uh, please, our viewers, you can also watch this program on YouTube, on CMTV Boss, and the boss is B-U-Z-Z. -Z. You can also watch this program. It's a live program, and the program is always on Saturday at 3 p.m. We are sorry that we started today a bit late. Doctor, uh, looking at your life stories, they are so touching. They're so empathetic. And doctor, I want you 
to tell us one of the most happiest time in your life because i'm an applied positive psychology and i as a tv presenter i, I see i want people to be happy in life so what can make people happy in life and what can make people successful we have seen situations where some of our youths out there they have given up they have dropped out from school they are not doing a trade they move they move up and down in the neighborhood they are not doing anything so doctor in five seconds say something out say something that can change a life of a Cameroonian youth living in a very difficult neighborhood living in a camp living in a shanty town say something that can help a child see light at the end of the tunnel you have to ask yourself what do you want for your life what do you want to become do you want to end around there where you are or you want to make a difference and emerge from where you are and change and contribute in changing society the most important thing that has made me to be happy in life is achieving my dream of becoming a, a university don becoming a scholar it is a fulfilling thing to see yourself achieving a dream that you had in form five so it makes you happy it makes you to believe that no matter where you come from, no matter your situation in life, no matter the background, no matter whether you have a parent or not, there must be a way that you will have to go through to get your dreams fulfilled. And when you get those dreams fulfilled, you become very full, satisfied and it makes you happy. And you, in the, you are in, at that point, you are in a better position to what tell made you, others. What made, doctor, what made you have uh, confidence for yourself? Confidence. Because one thing that keeps people moving is self-esteem. Of course. And we have seen that most of our youth today, they don't believe in who they are. You have already said it all. Believing in yourself, having self-efficacy. Believing in yourself that you can do this thing. If this person can do it, then I can do it. What is the difference between him and uh, uh, and I, are we not human beings? We are all human beings. Therefore, if he or she can do it, then I can also do it. Okay, and looking at that perspective, looking at that perspective, doctor, the perspective of self-esteem, what was your first, how was your first experience in the university hall in Chishi? <laughs> it was a very, very challenging. You know, uh, as a graduate, assistant remember i told you i started teaching as a graduate assistant while doing master's degree in university of nigeria and suka and i entered a, a, a first year class or a, it was a second year class and it was a very large class of more than 250 students and as a young man uh, permit me doctor we have some messages here uh from Madame Getty from Bunduma, she's saying that, wow, doc, I'm watching your show live now. It's really awesome and enriching. Congratulations, doc. Right on, doctor. Yes. So my experience as a lecturer in class for my first time, when I entered this lecture hall with 250 students, and I stood and I was looking at them. They were looking at me. and. When I tried to talk, the noise was increasing, and I tried to control the class. I was not able to control it. I became classroom management is an issue. Yes, I became confused, and at one time I just had and, to. And be... permit me, doctor. And my first experience in teaching was in the university too, in Amphi 750, with uh, one of my mentors, Doctor Bongwong, and you, with more than 500 students in class, and I was not that nervous. And I, I believe that self-esteem can make our youth how they achieve their life goals. So apart from self-esteem, doctor, what helped you to navigate your teaching experience in the university? You know, continuous teaching makes you become perfect and be able to manage the class. And also being able to have confidence in yourself, yes, preparing doctor. your, make sure you have a mastery of your materials so that when you talk, you talk with authority and the students will be able to listen to you and so 
remember when I uh, uh, when I started talking and the students discovered that this guy was talking sense and I was talking with authority and the noise had to die down gradually and another challenge I faced was eye contact you know I happen to be a very shy person and uh, you enter a class as a very young okay, man. Okay, doctor. Doctor, yeah. yes, uh, I'm coming from that perspective you're saying. Yeah. Uh, looking at you, a young, tender age. I discovered that uh, we are age mates, but you had your PhD at the at the age of 30, and it's very difficult in Cameroon to see a PhD holder at the age of 30, doctor. And I congratulate you for that. Thank you. And as a young scholar, as we are growing up. You used to think that only our fathers of age 50, 60 could have a PhD. What was that energy that motivated you to have a PhD at the age of 30? Because I myself have had that same experience. As I told you, just being focused in what you are doing and being humble and also working with the right people and choosing the right friends. And I believe now, in this era... Who are the right friends? Who are the right friends? The right friends are those who help you, who contribute, who contribute to multiply and add into your life. Not in those terms who, of what? Not those... In terms, in terms of, terms of specific, sir? In terms of the direction in which you are going in life. Whether you want to... Whatever you want to become. If you have able are you to saying choose, that whatever you want to become, you can become in life? Yes, and you choose the people, you choose to you interact with people who are in that area and who are able to act and multiply to your life in that area. Wow, wow, wow. Because there are also people who will be wanting to subtract and divide from your life. So choose the people that are able to act and multiply in your life in that domain which you are pursuing in life. Wow, wow. So are you saying that our youth out there, our adolescents out there who are involved in peer pressure, it's always good to make friends with successful people? Absolutely. Okay. So who are some of the successful people in life that you have made friends with them and you are succeeding? Of course. I've made friends with, I told you that I started volunteering for a lecturer when I was just about graduating which means I was already trying to align myself with somebody that is in the field where I am heading to. And also, I was already being mentored. I already saw somebody in that field as a mentor who was telling me the direction to follow to achieve my goals. mentor mentee relationship. Yes. Doctor, uh, this question goes, you know, we are living in sub-Saharan Africa and it's difficult. Yeah. Many, many children have not gone to school. Many children have dropped out from school. An international convention of the human rights says that children have the right for education. And I want to ask you, doctor, when you look at the, uh, the educational goal for all, that every child should go to school. Yeah. When you look at the sustainable development goal for lifelong education, quality mm -hmm. education and assurance for mm -hmm. African children by vision, the vision by vision, the vision that says that by 2030, should all children should be able to be literate, mm -hmm. and the Millennium Development Goal failed. Mm -hmm. So, doctor, how, as a scholar, I want to ask you, must everybody go to school to become successful? Everybody must not go to school to become successful, but everybody must have some level of education to become successful. Schooling is not necessarily that. education education is not necessarily schooling that's what i want to say education is not necessarily schooling which means you must not necessarily go to school to acquire education so you can acquire education through the other means which we know so what are the other means the informal the non-formal ways through skill building yes skills. so our uh, doctor when you look at uh, our educational system as a scholar you are and you find yourself in educational leadership. Mm -hmm. As a scholar, a school administrator, our educational system, I see it blur. Because at the end of the day, student, uh, students, after their graduation, they are still hunting for jobs. They cannot employ themselves. And when you are from Nigeria, you schooled in Nigeria. And I want to ask you, in Nigeria, they do the youth service. 
why in Cameroon that's not the case? And I want to ask you, what are some of the things that we can implement into our curriculum to bolster our educational system that is porous to an extent? First, let me concentrate on the higher education system where I'm interested, the university system. Remember, I already told you that the, the funding challenges of our universities are making our universities not to have the necessary resources and infrastructure to impart into the students the quality education that is required to create jobs in society. And as a result of that, we produce students or graduates who are finding it difficult to get employed. So first, we will need to boost the funding of our universities to get them acquire the necessary resources and the mat infrastructure that is needed to train quality citizens who will be able to create jobs and uh, uh, succeed in society. Thank you, Dr. Emmanuel Shungwa, great doctor from the University of Boyo. Bamenda. Sorry, I keep on saying uh, I keep on saying Boya from the University of Bamenda, but I see someday coming to contribute in the University of Boya. All right. But, uh, doctor, uh, I want you to give your last words to our viewers out there. Looking at the camera, straight into the camera, what advice as a university done can you give to the youths out there and to the government of Cameroon to improve on our educational system? Look at the camera, please. All right, uh, let me begin. Uh, with the youth. We have just two minutes to go. Yes, uh, my fellow compatriots, uh, citizens of the Republic, I will want to motivate you that focus in the direction of your destiny. And if at this point, if you are in a university, for instance, and you've not been able to identify where you are heading to in life, you must first be able to identify where you are heading to and focus directly on it. Choose the right friends, choose the right mentors, and choose the right people in society to interact with, and be humble, be respectful, and be obedient, and you will find yourself succeeding because you will see people coming from different angles to help you to succeed in your career. And to the government, I will want to call on the necessary policy makers and implementers speak directly to the to, minister of higher education of course i'm talking to him of course he is one of the key implementer of a policy in higher education uh, there is need to restructure our higher education system towards professionalization that will help our graduates to be able to develop skills quality skills that will make them create jobs in society Doctor, not necessarily I, making I them to this question. graduate i want to ask you this question before we go the producer is saying our time is up, up. doctor what was your first salary in life how much was your first salary in life and how did you take it my first salary in life was in any job you did in any job i did before you had your recruitment as a university done what was the first salary you ever had in life my and my first salary in life was a volunteered motivation. How much was that? It was 20,000 naira. 20,000 naira converted to Cameroon. Converted uh, to Cameroon currency. should be uh, 30 something thousand francs. And that 30 something. And that was my first salary as a primary school teacher after I left the government teacher training college. And I want to say that uh, in life, we must be humble, we must be selfless, we must be loyal. Humility takes you to places and effort and agency. Thank you, Dr. Emmanuel Shu, for coming. Thank you very much, Dr. Busi. And I appreciate your program, and I appreciate the fact that you invited me as the pioneer guest of the program. And I'll be ready to come again anytime you want me to come. You're welcome. I'm your host, Dr. Busi Enes Neba, on the show, Reckoning Life Paths. I feel that as people, we face different life challenges. And I tell you, my people, the youth out there, never give up. In life, there's always the beginning. And you should be able to work hard and put effort and be resilient in order to overcome life difficulties. There's light at the end of the, the tunnel. See you on Saturday at 3, 3 p.m. I've been your host on the show, Dr. Busi Enes Neba. Reckoning Life Path. Thank you.
See you next time. Bye-bye.